please welcome to the stage, Nikki Case. So here's a story. I was born in Singapore. Uh, it's this Southeast Asian island it's somewhere. Uh, and bubblegum is illegal there for some reason. So when I was five, I had this dream. I would make the life choice and go down the path of becoming a bubblegum dealer in the black market. <laughs> I would become this Willy Wonka, Walter White-esque figure. I would run this operation all around the city. And when the feds would finally catch me, my final words would be, well, I guess I got myself into a sticky situation. <laughs> That did not happen. Uh, so I was born in Singapore. Uh, and then my family and I, when I was pretty young, we moved to Vancouver, Canada. Uh, and I wanted, whoo, Vancouver. <laughs> it sure is rainy. <laughs> and I wanted to make my parents proud, you know. And being Asian parents, I was thinking, should I be a doctor or a lawyer? No, I decided at the age of 10, I was going to be a doctor and a lawyer. I would practice all the medicine and then sue myself for malpractice. <laughs> it's a profitable revenue stream loop thing. Yeah, it will be great. Uh, that did not happen. So here's the story. And it's the real story this time up to now. Uh, I was born in Singapore, moved to Canada, and I did not make my parents proud. Uh, I came out as queer to them, uh, and I'll be talking more about this later, and, you know, kind of crappy family dynamic for a while, so I had to move out. Uh, and I moved, so moved from Singapore to Canada, and now to America. America. <laughs> Woo. And it was good. Like, uh, I moved to the Bay Area, so very supportive people there. Uh, and I was doing independent creative work. Uh, but so now I had to think about my next dream, since, you know, Willie White isn't going to work out. <laughs> Willie White. Um, <laughs> so my life goal at the beginning of 2014 was to become a hit independent game developer. I'd make this magnum opus. I'd make the next super meat craft. It, it, it would be great. <laughs> It'd be great. Uh, yeah, not as cool as a bubblegum kingpin, but hey, I'll take it. But, uh, you, you know, is, is anyone here an uh, independent game developer? You know it's pretty stressful. Uh, and also, not just the present stress, but also anxiety about the future. Because if life is a whole infinite branching path where in one I can be a game developer and in one I'm a doctor and a lawyer, then uh, if I just make one wrong choice, then everything falls apart. I'm off the path forever. But so there's the present anxiety, future anxiety, and also the past anxiety, because what if I've already made that mistake? What if I shouldn't have had come out and you know, still stayed in school? What if it was already too late for me? What if I was, you know, already broken? So, that's chaos. Life is a chaotic system, and I'm going to contribute to the long, wonderful legacy of butchering science <laughs> for the sake of some things, I guess. So chaos theory, uh, a chaotic system is defined as a system where small changes in input can result in large changes in output, uh, sensitivity to initial conditions. You know, the butterfly effect, uh, a butterfly fla flapping its wings can cause velociraptors to escape from their pen. <laughs> so today I'm going to butcher chaos theory to ask the question I was asking myself uh, at the start of 2014. How can I get rid of life's chaos? Yeah. Uh, first, let me get some water because I am dying. <laughs> Middle of 2014, I was, I've been working on this magnum opus for a year. Uh, it was like some multi-year long game dev project that, uh, that I was just working on by myself. And, well, I mean, I thought I was halfway through it. And you know, it's, who knows? 
Uh, and I already had like a crowdfunding, crowdfunding campaign. I had like pushed out like an hour long demo, got lots of press, and, and, and I was like so hyper focused for an, that entire year. Uh, except for like one little small side project, which I'll talk about. Um, it was this interactive explainer, which taught you the code and math behind how to make the lighting effect that was in my game. Spoopy. <laughs> And yeah, it was a little small side project I made just in two days, and then I just forgot about it and went straight back to work. But later on, uh, halfway in the year, uh, yeah, June 2014, I just got this itch to make another you know, small side project. And it was this small, there was this small game jam that was going on for three weeks to make, uh, the game jam was about making narrative-based games, and since it was only three weeks, I decided to go ahead and make Coming out Simulator 2014. The title is a horribly bad inside joke about Surgeon Simulator and Goat Simulator. <laughs> Did not age well. Anyway, so yeah, it's an interactive story about, uh, it's a semi-fictionalized account of my coming out as bisexual to my Asian parents, which I have alluded to before that, um, all of the shit hit all of the fans. <laughs> yeah, it was a half true story about half truths. And so my goal with this uh, was to try to convey the anxiety of coming out to the player person. Uh, the nerve, you know, the anxiety, the nerve wracking decisions you'd have to make that would have huge consequences. And to give that player that feeling, uh, here's what I did. Yeah, uh, you know, pretty standard branching tree of uh, life stories. Uh, but it, uh, game designers would know that this solution does not scale because if you add just like one more choice at the end, number of outcomes doubles, things go exponentially, everything goes to crap, crunch time, everyone's sad. It's, you know, basically typical game death life. So, but I only had three weeks, so I didn't want to make all that exponentially growing story tree, so here's what I did. In addition to all those big choices uh, in between the story, there were lots of these little small in-between choices. Uh, and they would unpredictably affect and subtly flavor the later parts of the story. Uh, and the important thing is that the player wouldn't be able to tell in advance which ones were the big one, which ones were the small one. And so that's where the anxiety comes in. Uh, yay! Uh, that... <laughs> that you can't tell which are going to be the big or small things, like something you thought was small was going to have a, is going to have a huge, big, unpredictable effect. Anything you say or do could bite you later on. That's chaos, if I haven't ham hammered that down enough yet. So I published that, and it did really well. Uh, it got half a million plays, and it was nominated uh, this year for Best Narrative at the Independent Games Festival. Oh, oh thanks. Uh, but above the, all that popularity stuff, uh, it was really awesome to see that it was affecting and helping real people. Just all these hundreds of emotional fan mail from queer teens around the world, I still remember many of them specifically. Like, my game really helped them, or it was closure for them. That was really powerful. And just like in Coming Out Simulator, or the whole chaotic, the tying in, tying in thing, that small choice to make that small game for a small game jam affected my life personally in a really huge way. Because prior to making Coming Out Simulator, I'd only known you know, the story that actually happened to me. But to make, in making that interactive uh, version with all the different possible outcomes, I had to like, think about and write about every single thing that could have happened but didn't. And every ending had its own pros and cons. Like, if I didn't come out, I would have had a better relationship with my family, and, and you know, and I would have had a better relationship with my brother. But at the same time, I wouldn't have been really honest to myself, and also would have had the drive to have made my own life otherwise. I, I don't really, I can't make that decision. That's not better or worse, it's just different. And seeing all these different possibilities was kind of therapeutic. And as a teaser for the end of this talk, there's gonna be another, uh, I'll give you the 
extra ending of what happened after a coming out simulator with my family. Teaser. <laughs> so, but no time to think about that because another unexpected change was about to happen. Uh, from the small choice I made earlier, remember that interactive explainer I just talked about a few minutes ago? Remember that? Remember a few minutes ago? Those were good times. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yay chaos. Okay, let me skip back. All right. Da -da -da -da. Remember the interactive explainer I just made? So that got on the front page of Imgur, Reddit, and Hacker News simultaneously, and so that got the attention of Rhett Victor, uh, an, a famous interaction designer that I really look up to. Therefore, thank you. Therefore, uh, he invited me to some workshop on education where I met Vihart, uh, pop, another popular uh, educational YouTuber I also look up to. Therefore, she, uh, we talked a little bit and she wanted to collaborate with me on a project. Therefore, we made this. Uh, an interact, uh, I guess there's one more slide. We made uh, this. <laughs> Parable of the polygons. Uh, so this actually combines two threads from my life story so far. Uh, one of interactive explainers, and the second about talking about bias. You know, coming out simulator was you know about that. Well, it was about many things, but half of that was that. Uh, so in Parable of the Polygons, it's an interactive explainer about how individual biases can become collective biases. And so the pl uh, player reader, I'm not sure. It's like a half blog post, half thing. So uh, the audience uh, gets to learn about this by running little simulations, dragging little cute shapes around. All these little shapes are so cute and slightly shapist against one another, <laughs> but only slightly. Um, so each shape here uh, is unhappy if uh, less than a third of the neighbors are like them. So this one, yeah, I got all triangle neighbors, so it's pretty unhappy. This one, yeah, has only uh, two out of seven of its neighbors. They're like it, so it's unhappy. Uh, but so this means you know, less than a third, so each shape will be okay being in the minority. But a small biases over time accumulate into larger biases. And so that's something we really wanted to teach uh, that uh, even though today, you know, no one, very few people are explicitly sexist or racist, and yet still the institutions and systems can still be greatly racist and or sexist. So yeah, and that's kind of a recurring theme in chaos theory, small things becoming big, if you haven't noticed me hammering that over and over again. So that really took off. Uh, Parallel Polygons got three million plays. It was written up on Wired, The Atlantic, and Washington Post, and I guess it got me invited here, so that's also a thing. <laughs> And now this interactive explainer thing was becoming a whole separate thread of my life. And so I started, keep, I kept making more, and here's a couple that I'm uh, currently working on. So more teasers. So what I'm working on is an interactive explainer about privacy and social media. And a, lot of, a couple speakers yesterday were talking about the uh, systems and structures behind online harassment. So I wanted to make an interactive explainer about that because who, who would have thought that social media designed to give people exposure would leave people exposed? <laughs> like, who did, whoa, who would have thought? <laughs> and the other thing that I'm working on uh, that I hope to publish next week, uh, but I'm independent, so never trust me when I say it's coming out next week. <laughs> It's about this, about neurons, and specifically neurons and anxiety, and uh, showing the two simple rules of how neurons learn and unlearn. Uh, it's called Hebbian and anti-Hebbian learning, if anyone cares. Um, and also talking about exposure therapy, conditioning, and cognitive behavior therapy, and hopefully uh, this letting people see that there's really a system in their brain will make them feel less, I guess, I guess helpless to their own brains, and hopefully it can help some people's. So I, I was like kept on researching all this, all these systems and everything. And as a slight tangent, like I think thinking in systems is one, not just a better way of understanding the world, but 
it kind of forces you to, it's an empathetic exercise to like see specifically how even good individuals can create and be part of bad systems. Anyway, so, but related to systems thinking is complexity theory and chaos theory. And so it turns out not only are there systems where order arises out of chaos, like power to polygons, everyone's equally mixed, and then a small bias turns everything to crap. Uh, there are systems that thrive on chaos, like evolution. It's about random mutation and non-random selection. If you take away the random mutation, everything goes extinct. So it's really amazing to think about that. We are all here. All life on Earth exists because of properly harnessed chaos. But now, uh, working on that whole interactive explainer thing was like working really well uh, up until like right now. Um, but this left me with, left me with a problem. Uh, that previous magnum opus dream of making super meat fez craft boy would be, I don't know, I, I just couldn't, well at least I couldn't work on that one project anymore that had been taken like a year and a half at this point. So I felt like really, really bad because like, you know, once, I really sunk uh, an, a year and a half into it. I had fans, I had people who backed me on the crowdfunding campaign. And they'd be so disappointed if I just killed it. So I, well, I, I well, actually, I'll just, I, I just killed it. So, <laughs> and so I refunded everyone, refunded everyone, and gave them a long explanation. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I failed, yay. <laughs> I have an incentive for you to clap longer because I can actually drink. <laughs> so I refunded everyone, gave them a long explanation of why I had to go, giving them a little bit of behind the scenes of game design thinking and uh, something about interactive exp explainers. Um, and surprisingly, they were all really supportive. They, and were there, they were also excited to see my new thread that I was exploring, uh, interactive explainers. So this was a huge, pleasant surprise. Yeah, I, I had no idea that killing your dreams would be so fun. It'd be <laughs> But with that old dream dead, what next big thing would I chase? Like, I don't know, the Willy Wonka, Walter White thing was still pretty appealing at the time. Uh, but, and then I could chase the whole interactive education dream, whatever that would look like, but I'd be in the exact same point as I was before. Present, future, and past anxiety. And I know life's chaos would knock me off the path or help or make me find a better path. And I had already invested all that in that and then I have to quit again and it'd be sad. So I was kind of floating for a while. Like not, I wasn't unproductive and I wasn't, well, okay, I was anxious, but I, yeah, I was really uneasy with just not having a goal in life. But about last month, uh, after I learned about chaos theory on Wikipedia, and so now I'm an expert. <laughs> <laughs> All the pieces just started coming together, and it started getting me to think deeper and more carefully about life's chaos. So revisiting that question, how can I get rid of life's chaos? And right now, I think the answer is Don apostrophe T. <laughs> Instead, we should ask how not can we not avoid chaos, but adapt to chaos. And so, first, adapting to future chaos. Because if you just have like one specific dream that's like really far out, your magnum opus, you get tunnel vision, and you don't see the other opportunities that are available to you. Some of which you might like even more. So let go of your defined life path. Uh, kill your dream. Actually, serial kill your dreams. <laughs> Because while your dreams might look appealing from very far away, I assure you that up close, <laughs> it's... <laughs> it's really not the case. <laughs> this is my wallpaper now. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and then this present chaos. So if chaos theory tells us that we, it's really hard to predict the future, maybe it's not worth it to predict the future and instead we should explore the present. Get a feel for all those other life paths. Make some room for chaos. You know, get, make a side project once in a while, learn new things, meet new people, uh, prepare a talk at 2 a.m. last morning, last night, this morning. 
Yeah. Uh, and don't get too hung up on sticking to the path. So experiment, improvise, um, improvise. Because <laughs> you never know when these threads of your life will all come back to an amazing and unexpected beautiful outcome. And lastly, it is adapting to past chaos. And I promised you that extra ending uh, with my family after coming out simulator. You know, so let me just take five seconds and just tease you with that, my drink. The bottle is empty now. <laughs> so it actually happened a couple months ago. And it actually happened here. Well, not here, but Port uh, actually uh, Portland. Uh, so yeah, my family moved out to Vancouver, Canada. And they were just, I guess, passing through or something. And for context, we had not been in contact for a year. And I don't know why. I, I still don't know why. But I was an emotionally good enough place at the time to reach out to them, and we hung out. It wasn't you know, a tearful reunion or anything, but I think it was good, like closure. And it was kind of a bittersweet closure. Like, so they saw that I had adapted. Uh, and it was also good for me to see that they and my brother uh, had adapted as well, because when I left, it was kind of a wake-up call for them to be more accepting of each other in that family. They were a better family after I left than, uh, than they were when I was there. That's good. Oh yeah, as for what this is, uh, we hung out at the Portland Art Museum. That's somewhere wherever West is. And they were, they were showing off you know, uh, ancient Asian art, including pottery. And so it's, there's something really awesome that uh, I learned about Japanese pottery. This is called kintsugi. It is the Japanese art of mending stuff you fucked up and broke. Um, <laughs> so on, you know, with a normal tea bowl, normally you just throw away the, uh, you know, after it breaks, you throw it away. But not with kintsugi. Uh, you mend it, and, but you don't hide the scar. It's illuminated with gold. At the same time, its damage does not define it. It's still a tea bowl. It does not define it, but it is a part of it. So if chaos strikes in your past and things fall apart, know that broken pieces can be put back together, probably not in the same way, and you won't be the same afterwards, but that's, that's, that's OK. It's only a part of you, but it's not define you. Damage does not define you. And there were many awesome talks uh, earlier in XOXO about uh, people who have experienced trauma and how they moved forward and built something beautiful out of those broken pieces. I just want to like quickly say that I'm not romanticizing trauma. I'm not like, to be a true artist, you have to suffer for your art. Because, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but putting back the pieces, but I, what I am saying is that you can put the pieces back together, that you can adapt to chaos. Because on this infinitely branching tree of life, there's no way to go back, but there's every way to go forward. Thank you. <laughs>